So let's see like where we were uh, last week. So we talked about we talked about uh, in a CNN or a standard CNN architecture, we have network parameters. And the goal is we want to learn those network parameters when we train our uh, CNN. And when we say network parameters, we mean like the kernels or the filters, which we use to move from one layer in the CNN network to the next layer. And uh, all of you are, I think, very well familiar with uh, this operation where you apply the filter at location in your input feature map, get a value, and that's how you get your feature map in the next layer. Now, these are the kernels, or these are the weights, uh, or we also call those network parameters, uh, and our goal is to learn those uh, parameters automatically. Now, this is a nice visualization of a CNN, which is already being, uh, uh, which is already trained. And given an input image, it can predict uh, what object is present in the input image. So in this case, if a car is present, it can predict that a car is present. And this is showing the activations or the feature maps, uh, which I showed you in the last slide, which uh, we obtain when we apply the learned kernels on the, on the input layer. So for example, if we apply the learned kernels on this input image, we get feature maps, something like and so that's like a one convolution layer. We can apply activations on top of that. So in this case, we have ReLU. So we filter out all the negative values and this continues like uh, throughout this network. We do have some pooling layers. So this is like all we have already covered, just to recap. Now that's the learning process. And this is something which we are going to talk about today. And we have a uh, cover part of it, like we talked about gradient descent algorithm last uh, last week. And the idea is like, it will have some input data, it will have the network which will make some prediction. And based on the prediction which the network is making, we will have a loss function, which will determine whether the predictions are good or not. And based on that loss function, we are going to penalize the network. If the loss is very high, we will penalize it like more. If the loss is like uh, close to zero, then we know that the network is already like trained and we don't need to modify it a lot. So based on that loss function, we are going to back propagate in the network. And by back propagate, I mean, we're going to update uh, the network weights or the kernel weights, which we have initialized randomly when we start our training. Okay. So as I said earlier, we need a loss function to determine how good our network is performing, how good the prediction which the network gave is like close to our ground truth. And there are different kinds of loss functions and we'll talk about, I think maybe a couple of those. So the idea is like uh, to judge the quality of your network's prediction. And based on this prediction, the next step is to update the weights, the network weights, and that process, we call it optimization or network training. And this is like a general formulation of any loss function. So I will just quickly go through this. I think uh, I remember we covered this last week as well. So we'll have an input and it could be like an image or a set of images. And these are like the network weights which we are going to learn, which we are going to update when we back propagate in the network based on the loss which we have. And this F is the network function. So we will compare whatever the network is predicting to our ground truth. And based on how far away this network prediction is from the ground truth, we will estimate like how good our network is based on this loss function. All right, then what we are going to do is for all the samples or all the batches, we are going to sum up these, uh, these losses, take the average, and that will give us a good estimate of how good our network is. Now this training process involves like a lot of steps and this is like the general case. What you will have is you will have n training examples. So X is like your one training example. It could be an image. It could be anything else. If you are training, not training for images, Y is your ground truth. This is your network, which you will define the image or the input data will be passed as an argument. And this function will make some prediction and based on the prediction, and this is like uh, your input data and theta, your network parameters, you will have loss function, which will tell you how good your uh, 
network is so far. Okay. Now we discussed gradient descent as well uh, last week where we saw that we can use gradient descent to optimize any uh, function we have. So in this particular case, uh, the function we have is our CNN architecture. So this is like just a simple function one uh, plotted in like one dimensional. And these are, this X axis is like, in this case, it's uh, the parameter to the function. But in our case, it will be like all the parameters or all the kernels we have in a network. So it represents the same thing. Now, when we are updating, like moving towards the right, so this is our, our local, this is our minima which we are aiming for. So we'll have to update uh, these values as we progress. And I think we discussed this, uh, we can do this when, uh, by computing gradient at each point. So we'll compute gradient with respect to this particular variable. And again, so we'll have lots of lots of parameters. So we'll have to compute gradients with respect to all of those uh, parameters using a loss function. And then once we have that gradient, we, we discuss the equation, we take like one small step based on the learning rate towards this, uh, towards this minima. And based on the learning rate, uh, it will determine like how bigger our step will be. Okay, so as, uh, as you move like close to your minima, then your steps are getting smaller and smaller. And the reason is your gradient or your slope of this curve is getting smaller and smaller. And that usually happens with your normal CNN training as well. Okay, so uh, there are there are a lot of loss functions uh, which you can use and uh, we are not going to cover all of them in this course. So what we will do is we will only talk about the loss functions which are relevant to like the problems we are solving. So we will, when we are solving segmentation, we will see like what kind of loss functions we can use for segmentation, or if you are doing action detection, we'll talk about those loss functions. But today we'll only talk about uh, cross entropy. This loss function is used mainly used for classification kind of problem, and classification like if you have an image or a video, you want to predict like what uh, action is being performed or what object is present present in that in that image. So for that kind of uh, classification or recognition problem. This is a standard uh, loss function. We call this a uh, cross entropy. And so let me give you like a quick uh, intuition why this is a very good loss function. So why I had is like, uh, I think the network prediction. Okay, let me just, okay. So this why I had is uh, the network prediction. Why I is the ground truth. Now, this is a classification problem. Now, when I say this is a ground truth, uh, let's consider an image where we have a car present. All right. So, why I will tell you whether the car is present or not. So, ground truth will say present, then this value will be one. Okay. So, what we do is we solve a classification problem using a one hot vector as a ground truth. For example, in your classification problem, if you have 10 different categories, right? Uh, and that can, that can be your, let's say it's a digit classification. So you have 10 different digits and then you have to predict like for each of the digit, whether that digit is present in the input image or not. So what you will do is you will have a 10 dimensional feature vector and each bit of that feature vector will be one or zero based on whether that particular digit is present in the input image or not, all right? So in this case, let's say uh, it indicates a car. Then if the car is present, this will be one and all the other bits will be zero. Now this is the network's prediction. Now, if the network predicts a car is present, then it will be close to one, all right? And then this is already one and log of one is zero. So this term reduces to just zero and which is fine because we are saying that we have zero loss. It means the network is predicting perfectly. All right. Now I will come back to this term later on. Let's just focus on this one first. Now let's say the car was present. So this is again one, then we can just ignore it because it's a multiplication, but the network predicts uh, the car is not present. So this will be zero. All right. And log of zero is close to negative infinity. And we have a negative term here. So that will turn it into infinity, which means like the loss is infinite. 
So I mean, of course, it will not be infinite. It will be a very big number, and which is fine because the car was present, but the network says car is not present, and the law says it's infinite, and which is good. It means that uh, it's a very high value, and we're going to penalize our network for that using that higher loss. And you can uh, plug in and like see the results for other values as well. Let's say for 0.5, so we'll get some higher value for loss. And as you go close to zero, it will increase. As you come close to zero, uh, close to one, it will reduce. So that's like the general intuition, but it's like more than that. But uh, that's fine for I think this course. So this is like the uh, this is for the positive uh, label you have uh, in your data. And we just walk through this, and it kind uh, it kind of works. Now let's see this second term. So this second term is uh, for negative class for cases when the object is not present. All right. So, for example, uh, let's talk about a category. Let's say horse, and horse is not present in this uh, particular image because it was an uh, image of car. Then, what will happen is uh, the bit for horse will be zero because it's not present. Then, one minus zero is one. So, we are always going to ignore this term because this term is for negative classes, and for negative classes, the ground truth is always zero. And this is one, so that's ignored. Now, come back to this. Now it's the same logic as we discussed here. If the network predicts zero, this is one. So again, the loss will be zero. But if the network predicts one, then it becomes zero and it becomes infinite because of this negative term. So it's the same logic as we were going through uh, for this particular term. So that's how your cross entropy works. And this is like for classification again. So another loss function is mean squared error. What you do is if your ground truth is uh, y i and uh, the the network prediction is y, you just compute like the mean square distance between these two uh, values, and it's useful like for if you are doing regression, and regression is like when you are not categorizing, you are predicting some values. So then your mm, this MSC loss is useful. This is also useful when you are. Uh, let's say doing uh, video synthesis or image synthesis because you have to predict like each and every pixel of that image or, or of that video, and then you want to compare whatever you have predicted for each pixel to the ground truth. So then, again, this MSC loss is useful there. All right. Now, an important point to note here is that so we talked about gradient descent, right? We will use a uh, gradient descent for training our network. Now, as we saw, for each of the parameter, we need to compute uh, the derivative with respect to the loss function to update that particular parameter. All right. So to compute the derivative, it has to be differentiable. Right. So, and that enforces like a lot of restrictions on what you can define inside your network. So the first thing is the loss function. So whatever loss function you define, it will have to be differentiable. Because if you can't differentiate it, then you will not be able to compute that gradient, or you will not be able to compute that slope, which is required to take those mini steps to go to the uh, optimal point. So that's the first requirement. And all, both the loss functions we just discussed, cross entropy as well as mean squared error, you can easily see that both are differentiable. So this term is differentiable, this is differentiable. And again, this function is also differentiable. So the next thing is activation function. Now, whatever activation function you use inside your network, it should be differentiable. And all the activation functions, I think, which we have discussed, like sigmoid, and we have discussed uh, tanage, both of them are differentiable. We also discussed ReLU. So let's talk about that. So ReLU, it's a nonlinear function, and if you if you just focus on values greater than zero, then it's perfectly differentiable because it's just a linear line and it's very the derivative like it's very fast to compute. You don't have to do anything. But for uh, exactly at zero, I mean you can't differentiate that function, right? But think about this like if you don't have anything to pass like through your activation which means it's zero, then you don't have to compute the derivative because it didn't get any activation or any input from that point onwards. So that's why we don't have to compute the derivative at that point, and that's how you can use it uh, as your activation function. 
Now convolution, you know this operation, this is like a kind of a weighted average when you look into the, the exact mathematical formulation. So again, you can uh, differentiate that. Pulling operation, again, that is differentiable. And I mean, there could be, there could be like many other uh, possibilities, like depending upon what, you, what kind of network you are uh, devising, then just keep in mind, whatever you do, that should be differentiable. Otherwise you will not be able to train your network. Okay, so let's talk about back propagation and why we need this. So if you have a single layer network, then you know that whatever output you get, it will be just a combination of uh, the neurons in that particular layer. And let's talk about like just fully connected layers. And in your final uh, loss formulation, you're getting just input from those neurons. So you can directly compute like one step uh, derivation because you can just differentiate the loss function with respect to all those neurons or the weights in those neurons and you will get the gradients to operate those weights. But usually your network, uh, uh, they are very deep. They have multiple layers. And the question is, if you have multiple layers, then how can you compute derivative of the loss function with respect to like all the parameters inside the network? And the answer is chain rule. Uh, that's from your uh, whatever you have learned in, uh, in, in when you learn uh, derivatives uh, in your calculus, right? So, and the rule is pretty simple. You have to compute, if you have to compute a derivative, let's say this is a loss function with respect to X, what you can do is you can have an intermediate variable, Z in this case, and what you can do is you can compute the partial derivative with respect to this intermediate variable Z, and then again compute the partial derivative of that variable Z with respect to X, and then just take the multiplication. So that will give you the partial derivative with respect to X. Now, how this is relevant for your uh, deep networks? So what will happen is, let's say X is your first layer, some parameter in your first layer, right? And in the second layer, whatever parameters you have or whatever values or activation functions you have, that will be like some combination of this, all right? And then the second layer is like, let's say going to produce the output. Then if, then what you can do is for the, so the second layer, uh, for the second layer, let's say your parameters are represented by this Z. So you can easily compute this derivative because your second layer is directly compute, connected to the loss function. But then to get the derivative for the first layer, you can use this chain rule. You compute the derivative with respect to like the parameters in the second layer. And this is like the first layer and the, just do this multiplication. So what's happening is you can start computing derivative from the end, like uh, close to your loss function, start from the last layer and start moving like towards the input and just keep doing this multiplication using this chain rule. So you can get the gradients for each of the variables as you move on and you can keep updating their, uh, their values. All right, so that's why we have like two different passes in the network. The first one we call forward pass. And this is like uh, whatever input you have, you pass that to your network F in this case, and you generate the output. So that's called a data flow. So your features are like your data. You use the parameters of the network to do those transformations in the activation functions or whatever you have like feed forward layer or fully connected layer. You perform all those operations, keep moving forward and get the output. We also call this like the prediction. So that's feed forward. This is just data flow. You're not changing anything in your network parameters, okay? Now the second step is backward pass. In the backward pass, so based on the loss function you have and whatever your network predicted, you compute the loss and then what you do is you compute these partial derivatives at each step and based on the loss value, you will keep updating the weights or the parameters in the network when you move backwards. All right, so that's the backward pass. Now, one important thing to note is these partial derivatives, 
you don't have to actually you don't have to look at the final layer to compute the partial derivative in the first layer because that formulation it's fixed once you have like designed your network right that the formulation of the function it's not going to change so usually what we do is when we're doing the forward pass so we have these uh, gradient formulations handy so we just store them like in local variables and what we need is when we do a forward pass we just need the loss value so once we have the loss value then we can just use these uh, derivatives and just update the values based on that okay now this is a simple example of again that back propagation you have two different layers so the first layer the second layer and then the final prediction now feed forward is done when we are back propagating again as i said earlier you can compute these partial derivatives beforehand you don't have to know like the partial derivative at this point to compute the partial derivative at this point okay now let's say the output is ak here and e is your loss function so you will have to compute the partial derivative of e with respect to this ak and let's say that gradient is this delta k so you know the gradient at this point you can update the parameters at this particular neuron now what you can do is you know this formulation like this transformation whatever you and that depends on like uh, what formulation you have and it will be i think just it's a weight so it will be just a multiplication now next you do is you compute the partial derivative of this e with respect to this jk and that will be just uh, this aj multiplied with this partial derivative you have computed at this point so this was partial derivative of e with respect to uh, this uh, weight here which was used for ak right so you can back, back propagate it here we got ag times delta k and again you can compute the partial derivative with respect to uh, wij which is at this particular location right so you get delta j with this one and you can just multiply that with ai and you can then update this weight wij and it it doesn't matter like how big a network is you can just use this chain rule for as as many layers as you want now a, a couple of points to note uh, and again this is like nothing new this is uh, all from your calculus so when you have a add gate and by add gate means like when you're adding your features so let's say you have two set of features x1 and x2 so you do a summation x1 plus x2 so what will happen to the gradient so the gradient will be just distributed between uh, those those two and you can just uh, verify that uh, by performing the differentiation of two values then they are summed up so you will compute the partial derivative the first one so one will have to be considered constant so that will be eliminated and similarly when you compute when you're computing partial derivative with respect to the other one the first one will be gone so that's add gate max gate uh, it's like a gradient router and the reason is let's say you have 10 different values so let's say you are performing max pooling and you have 10 different pixel locations so max pooling will be like just uh, picking one of the value whichever is the highest and ignoring the rest of uh, rest of the values so by gradient router means if you're not using those, those values it means that whatever output you got that was independent of those values if you compute the derivative if it's independent then it will it will be zero so the gradient will not flow into those pixels or into those values so it will flow only to that that particular pixel from where you pick the value so that's why it's a gradient router for multiplication it's a gradient switcher because uh, if you have a multiplication operation then if you do the derivative so you that that uh, the mal the value to which you are multiplying that will not be lost it will still be there because uh, that's how the uh, that's how the differentiation works right so and that's why like uh, it will switch between those two values so if, if let's say you have x1 and x2 so whatever gradient is coming from from uh, from x1's direction it will go to x2 and from x1 it will go to x2 so that's fine so again the these details you should know but uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure if uh, they will be used like when you write your code because these are like most of these are automatically done. So you don't have to actually uh, write code for this. So, but still you should know like what's happening when you're training your network. Now, let me show you like a quick demo. And I think this is pretty cool. Uh, let me see if I can click on this one. Okay. So uh, can you guys see uh, my browser? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, somehow the chat is not visible to me. I don't know what's happening. So Ayush, is the browser visible? Yeah, it is visible. But I, I'm not sure, maybe your speaker is muted. So can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know what's happening. Okay, so I think, so can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. All right, sorry, sorry about that. I don't know why it was muted. Uh, so you can see my uh, browser screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, in this case, I think it's a very nice demo. And what they are showing is, they're showing like how the network prediction is changing as you are uh, training your network. And this is just like, a single layer network, you have two inputs. So two neurons, input one, input two. And then you have one output that will be your target. And this is like the network's prediction. And we are trying to implement uh, these four gates. So we have ZOR, we have OR, NAND, uh, NAND and AND. So it will show like when we start the training, these weights are initially uh, uh, randomly initialized. And as we train these, we can see how the network prediction is improving. So you can see here that uh, this is showing like the error, the network error. And right now we are trying to learn this uh, ZOR func function. And we just have like these five neurons and this is standard feed forward network. And this one here is showing like the network's prediction. You can see that uh, if it's a ZOR function, then for the center, center two rows, we should get like a one. And for the first and the last, we should get a zero. So this is like close to 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and this is 0 0.1, 0 0.07. Again, not perfect, but it's trying to improve. And you can see that how your error, which is like uh, the value your loss function will give is going down as it's training. And the second term here is epoch. And I think we will uh, cover this, what epoch means. So, And still it's not perfect, but it's doing a great job. And ZOR, it's a complicated function. So let's see like a simpler function, let's say AND. Okay, let's do AND and start. Yeah, uh, something, something is wrong. I think there is a bug. Okay, let's see this. Okay, so 
And the thickness here, you can see that this is like, uh, I think the weight values of, uh, the weight values of uh, the parameters which are connecting these two neurons. Okay, and so that's how your training process will also go on when you're training your uh, CNN. So let's try to understand a few of these terms like uh, what epoch is and I think we'll cover some other details as well. Okay, I hope you are able to see my slides now. Yes. Okay, great. So now one issue is uh, you can't uh, directly use gradient descent to train a CNN. And the reason for that is in your CNN, usually you have too many parameters, right? And you have too many parameters and to learn those parameters, you need like a lot of, lot of samples. So what will happen is when you will compute uh, your loss value for all of uh, those samples, then it's very hard to put everything in memory. So for each network, you will have to store those uh, weight values, right? And that's, uh, that's clearly not possible. So what we do is, so that's why we cannot apply like gradient descent with respect to all data points. So all data points, it means that uh, you take one sample image, do the feed forward pass, get the loss value, okay? Then do the same step for the second image and all the images, and then just average that loss value. And then use that loss to update the network parameters. That's like the most, uh, I think, uh, the best way to do gradient descent. But again, so as I said, our data sets can be large and we can't fit all of that into memory. So what we do is we randomly sample our data points. Okay, so stochastic gradient descent, that's SGD. It is like performing gradient descent based on each sample. So we will take one sample randomly. We will do the feed forward pass, get the loss value and use that loss value to upgrade, to update like all the parameters in the network. So that's SGD, but ideally uh, we don't do that uh, either because that's pretty bad. And I will talk about uh, why, the, the, why that, is, that is bad. So instead of that, what we do is we select like some sample uh, points, uh, a group of sample points, and we call those sample points mini batches. And that's why we call this like a mini batch gradient descent. Okay. And this mini batch or the number of samples you are randomly picking, that's called your uh, batch size. So that's a hyperparameter you will set when you're training your network. So keep that in mind. So that's batch size. Now, what we do is we randomly initialize uh, the network parameters, uh, the weights W, and then we will also have to set a learning rate. We know that from the gradient descent, it's the same thing. Now, this is the full training process. What you do is, unless you reach the minima, which means that your loss is not changing, you will shuffle your training set. So you will, let's say you have 100,000 images, so you will shuffle that order and that's important because uh, you don't want to use, always use like the same set of images uh, for each uh, batch. So if you do that, there are some drawbacks. And again, I think uh, we are going to cover that. Then what you do is after shuffling, you select your uh, mini batch. Okay. So let's say your mini batch is 10. So you will select 10 samples and for each image or each data point in that mini point uh, in, in that mini batch, what you will do is you will do the feed forward and get the loss. And then you will average out that loss value among all the samples in that mini batch. Okay. So that loss value will be used to perform this gradient descent. So then again, it's like just computing the gradients at each layer at each step and use the loss value to update the weights backwards. And this whole process is called one epoch. So in that demo, we, uh, we saw that uh, the number of epochs uh, was increasing. So that epoch was referring to this particular scenario. So one epoch is when you show your network all the training examples, right? And you do that over and over again. 
and there is another term which is i think uh, used widely that's called iteration so one iteration is showing like one batch to your network so sometimes like iteration is all uh, also used instead of epoch and one good reason for that is if you are training if your training size is too big let's say you have 100 million images so you don't uh, want to use all of those images in one of your epoch so what you do is in that case you count like number of iterations okay so epoch has like other uh, uh, other important thing, things as well so for example once you have shown your network all the training images so you did that using some kind of learning rate right so that learning rate was like the step you will take in each of the gradient descent step so usually uh, that learning rate can be changed once you have finished one epoch so that you like uh, reduce the step the size of the step you are taking so there are other like uh, important details which uh, needs to be uh, monitored uh, when you're looking into epochs so again i think there was some question or not but i don't know what's happening the chat window okay it's here right great so no question now since uh, what we are doing we are not showing like all the sample images or all the data points at once we are showing like a one batch at a time so what will happen is the loss will not always go down so it might increase as well for some of the iterations so this is like the general uh, trend you might observe uh, while you are training and here you can see that uh, in the x-axis we have iterations and you can convert this to number of epochs as well based on like how many iterations you have in each epoch so this is like uh, simply indicating your training progress so when you started and this uh, y-axis is showing you like the loss value okay so you started with a loss of negative four but it, it was going down but then you can see that it also increases so it's kind of fluctuating but usually it's going down so why this is happening this is happening because for some of the uh, batches it might it might not be like a good representation of your whole data set so it could be like the images you have selected in this particular batch they are kind of an outlier or have certain properties which doesn't match with like the overall properties of your data so that 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 could lead like loss to a different direction and it's not that simple but that's like just one intuition so again so the training data point or the batch is random so this might happen and you you will observe this a lot but still like over time it will converge so this is showing like a nice visualization of how your uh, network is converging that you when you're using gradient descent so this is your optimal point you want to reach at this particular location so that was this is a starting point so ideally what you should do is you should move in this direction because this is consider this like as a 2d surface and this is at a higher uh, at a higher elevation and if you compute the gradients so, so this is the gradient direction so this is like the ideal path uh, the network should follow or the training should follow but usually what happens is since you're not training on the full data set you will see like observe this kind of oscillation and that's why like when you use hgd it's uh, pretty slow to converge and we have lots of other optimization methods as well so which can actually try to overcome this kind of limitation and one uh, simple trick is to use momentum so what we will do is we will see like how fast our gradient was flowing in one particular direction based on whatever gradient we had in the last time step so we'll make use of that value and that's why it's called momentum because momentum from physics it's like if you are running then it's it's hard to stop suddenly right so it will take you some time to completely come to a halt and the reason is you have that momentum because of the speed or the velocity you have so the intuition is similar and in this case we are using the momentum of the gradients so this is like the update uh, rule which we discussed uh, in the last class so this is your updated weight value 
this was your initial weight value this gamma is the learning rate and this is the partial derivative with respect to derivative of the loss with respect to this particular parameter so based on this learning step you will subtract this value with the weight value to get the updated value so that's the normal update but what we do is we want to use the momentum of the previous gradient so what we'll do is now this is the updated rule so the same formulation the updated weight the original weight the learning rate but we have an additional parameter here and this parameter will tell you like how much of the momentum you want to use so how much of the gradient which was in the previous time step so this is t right and this is t minus one so how much of this gradient value you want to use for updating the, uh, the network weight in this particular time step so that's alpha and you will add that to the current gradient so this is like the updated rule uh, when you have momentum and another thing you can do is if you are if your network is converging very slowly it has it is having like a lot of oscillations you can increase or lower your learning rate right so if you lower your learning rate what will happen is it will because it will not it will not be able to take like long steps so the smallest the smallest steps will be like more uh, aligned towards this uh, gradient direction so that's like a optimized way but again the issue is if you have smaller steps then it will take longer time to reach this point so it will avoid like some kind of local minima because if you take uh, these longer steps it might fall into some local minima here but then the cost is like it will take uh, too long to optimize okay so learning rate uh, as we saw earlier it's like uh, it decides uh, how big your step is and as you're moving from a1 to a2 to a3 to a stop it will determine uh, the size of that step now we talked about uh, this curve this is called a standard loss curve and this is your training progress in the x uh, in the x axis so this is showing like epoch how many for how many epochs you have trained your network and the y axis is the loss value and this plot is showing like uh, how your loss value will vary based on what kind of learning rate you have so if you have a very high learning rate then your loss might go down but eventually it will increase and the reason is if you look at this curve so if your learning rate is big enough so that this point can jump like over this minimum so if, it can, so if it can jump from this point to this point right so it will jump to this point and in the next step it's going to jump to this point so it will take this trajectory so you can do the math here and that's called a high learning rate so if you're very high as high as it can make the points jump across the minima then it will diverge so you don't want that the other extreme is low learning rate, this blue curve. Okay, so you will take very, very small steps. Eventually you will reach here. So you can see that it's eventually going down, but it's taking a lot of time. So it will be very slow to converge. And you can see, see that it's very stable. Now there are other variations like you have high learning rate again. So this is a high learning rate but again, it didn't reach like the local minima, so it's jumping around. So this red curve, we also call this like a L curve. It's a good learning rate. It's coming down smooth and eventually it's going down. But again, these are like just, uh, just prototypes. Don't believe these. So this is like just to give you an idea like what is a very high learning rate and what's a very low learning rate. The curves in between, it will vary a lot. The real curve, which will see like in your trainings, they will not be this nicer, okay? But at least for the takeaway from this is, you should know what a very high learning rate is and what a very low learning rate is, okay? Now, the other issue we have is of uh, fitting. So fitting is like based on how many training samples you have, uh, how many parameters you have to train your network. So what will happen is if you have too many parameters, uh, it will overfit uh, the training data because then the scenario is such, uh, such that uh, 
your network parameters will try to learn each and every sample in your training set. And that's called uh, overfitting. Okay, let me see if there's a question. So there's a question from Furkan, which function in PyTorch you use to plot this, that loss graph? So in PyTorch, I'm not sure, I mean, those loss curves, you have the values. What you do is you can, as you're training, you can store those values and use like any normal graph, like visualization library, such as matplotlib or something like that. So TensorFlow provides you like TensorBoot uh, where you can visualize these, but I'm not sure like whether PyTorch has like such a integration. So Ayush, you want to comment on that? Yeah, the new PyTorch have built in TensorBoot, which is similar to TensorFlow. Okay, all right. So then you should cover this like the, in your tutorial. Sure. Okay, so Furkan, we will cover this. Thanks for the question. Okay, so overfitting is like your network, your network tries to learn each and every sample instead of like learning the, uh, the general, uh, the pattern in the data. So each and every sample is fitted and that's overfitting. Underfitting is like you don't have sufficient parameters to learn like a complex function. Now, one quick fix to that is you use more data than even if your network is like too big, it has too many parameters. If you use, if you increase your data, it might not overfit. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing is, how can we like uh, figure out whether the network is overfitting or not using the loss curve? Okay, so this is giving you the loss value. Again, this is the training progress. The blue is the training loss. Green is the validation, red is the test. So forget about this, just focus on training and validation. Okay, so training loss is coming down pretty nicely and it's still going down. So it means that one can assume that, I mean, the network is still learning, but what's actually happen what's, uh, what is actually happening is uh, the network is trying to overfit to each samples present in the training data. And how we know that? So if you monitor the green curve, which is for validation, so the validation loss was coming down, not that nice, but still it was coming down. But at this point of time, you can see that the loss is going up. It started to increase, which means that after this point, the network is performing pretty bad. But for the training data, it's performing pretty good. So it means that it's not learning. It's just trying to overfit on the training samples. So this is like one way to know if your network is doing overfitting or not. Okay, so let's uh, try to understand uh, what exactly this overfitting and underfitting is. And so there are several solutions like uh, to fix this uh, overfitting. And one of them is like regularization. And the idea is we don't want our network weights to fit to like individual samples. And still like uh, we want to use lot of lot of parameters so that we have like the complex uh, we have the flexibility to learn like complex functions so it's like a trade-off between these two and you don't have to reduce your network size if you're doing this now let's try to understand like uh, what data fitting is if we have a training data like this then one can easily assume that this might be just a straight line right and there might be some noise in your input data and that's why they are not perfectly aligned in that line. And that straight line might be a good fitting uh, if you're training, uh, training a network, right? But what will happen if you have too many parameters in your network, then instead of getting a straight line, you will get like a nice curve passing through each of these points. So yeah, so this is like a very nice fitting. This is first order polynomial. It means like you have very, very few parameters, probably just one or maybe two for one for the bias, right? And then this is like the second fit you have. This is ninth order polynomial, which means like you have nine different parameters to learn or maybe more than that. And then what is happening is this learned curve is passing through like each of these training samples. So this is overfitting, a good example of overfitting. And this you can 
uh, I will not call this underfitting. This is like just the right fit. So let's try to understand why this is bad. So let's say if we have a testing point, which is at this particular location. Now your network will not be able to predict it perfectly because it's not lying on this curve. It's far away from this, right? So you will get a high uh, loss value there and which is not right. But in this case, I think it will fall in this curve. So I think I have another example for that. And this is like just true class classification problem. We have a red and blue dots. We want to separate these two. So this is kind of underfitting because all of these blue dots, uh, these red dots are classified as blue. And in this case, it's overfitting because it's trying to draw very nice boundary passing through all the turns and all the curves we can. And something like this might be like the right fit. And these are just noisy samples, the red ones here and the blue ones here. Okay. So one good example, early fitting, uh, early stopping, I think we already discussed. Uh, then the next is regularization, then we'll see dropout and there are many other techniques to handle this. So early stopping, I think we already covered, uh, sorry about that, oh uh, yeah. So as, uh, as soon as you see that your loss is diverging for your validation set, you know that overfitting is happening. So if the loss is diverging for the training as well, it means your learning rate is too high. But if it's just uh, uh, converging for the training set, but not for the validation, it means it's like kind of overfitting. And it might mean a lot of other things as well. It could be like your learning rate is too low, which is causing the overfit, overfitting. So, but this is like one of the reason. Now, regularization is like, as I said, uh, we still want to use a lot of, lot of parameters, but we want to avoid overfitting. So what we do is we penalize the parameters for having higher weight values. So what we do is we, we learn the parameters such that they learn very small values. And the reason for that is, so let's consider this particular example. The blue one is like overfitting. The green is like kind of a right fit. So if we have higher weight values, what will happen is like the sm a small change in your input data will lead to a bigger change in your output. And that will lead to overfitting if you have a lot of, lot of parameters, okay? So then what will happen is e those parameters will try to learn like each of, memorize each of the input samples you have. Now, if you penalize your network weights to have very small value, then even if you have some change in your input data, which is due to noise or due to like sample variation, your output will not change drastically. So what we do is we add this regularization term to a loss function. So this is like the standard loss function, which we discussed based on the network prediction and the ground truth. What we do is we add another term in the loss, uh, in the loss function, which we call regularization. And this makes sure that the weight values are pretty small. So this is like just the uh, weight you want to use for uh, this re regularization term. And uh, so since this is a loss function and you always want to minimize your loss, so the values of these uh, weights will be minimized, okay? So whenever you will have a higher weight values, the loss function is going to penalize the network. And this is called the weight decay, that's fine. So usually for this uh, regularization function, we have different options. We have L1 norm. We just use the weight value. We can have L2 norm. We can use the squared value. So these are just variations. But all of these are just making sure that you don't have bigger weight values. Now that was one way. The other is uh, to use a dropout. And usually what we do is we uh, initialize the weight, uh, weights randomly. And the reason is like, uh, if we don't do that, if we have equal weights, the network will not start to uh, start it, uh, its training because all the uh, outputs will be almost similar. Now, what we can do is if we train uh, five different networks, because each time the network weights are initialized randomly, we can actually take average of uh, these networks, whatever output we get. And this works perfectly fine. We call that ensemble as well. And it tries to overfit, uh, try to, uh, it tries to avoid overfitting 
because overfitting is like specific to each network and it will happen differently like with uh, these set of networks. So when you take the average, I think the overfitting is avoided. Now dropout kind of uh, does that and but it does uh, that in a very efficient way. We don't have to train five different networks. What we do is in our network, we stochastically switch off some of the neurons while training. And we do this, uh, we do this randomly like in each uh, iteration, each epoch. And this helps in like regularizing, uh, regularizing your network because none of the weight will be like then dependent, uh, will be like important for making the prediction to which will make it more general. And there is like more to this, like uh, the neurons are not able to co-adapt, they learn independent, independent relations. But at the end, the, 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 ground, uh, the main point is that uh, you use dropout to make your uh, network not overfit in your, to your training data, okay? So the training steps is you should have a network, you should have a loss function, and again, everything in your network should be differentiable. The loss function should be differentiable. You initialize your network parameters randomly. Given a training data, you prepare batches for mini batch gradient descent. And then for each batch, you will do this feed forward step. You will get the loss. Then use the loss function to back propagate the gradients. Okay, and that gradient will be used to update the network parameters. And you repeat this process for all the batches, for all the data. And that will be your one epoch. And again, you repeat that. So you do this for like several epochs. And depending upon the problem, sometimes I think you have to train it for like 10,000 or even more than that as well. And that's why like training deep networks uh, take a lot of, lot of time. Now let's see like what network parameters uh, were used for training LXNet. Because now you're familiar with like, I think all the terms. So real activation was used for the first time. They used a dropout uh, of 0.5. So dropout of 0.5 means like half of the neurons will, will be switched off. And they use a batch size of 128. It means like uh, they have 120 save, uh, 128 uh, images. They compute the loss, do the uh, network update, and then go to the next batch. Okay, they used SGD. And as I said, like there are many different optimizers. SGD is like uh, just one of them. And in your trainings, like you don't have to use SGD. There are many other variants. And I think uh, we'll cover that when we talk about uh, PyTorch. So momentum was 0.9, you know what momentum is. They used the initial learning rate of uh, one in minus two. And there is a learning decay as well. This is another parameter I think we didn't cover. So they did it manually, but I think now you have like uh, deep learning frameworks which, uh, which can automatically do it for you. And there are many other sophisticated ways like not just decaying the learning rate. So what uh, they did is, as soon as like the validation accuracy was saturating at some point, it means that the network is not learning anymore. So then they reduce the learning rate. It means that it might be just lying around the minima, but not going to the minimum point. So reducing the learning rate will learning rate will move it further. And that you usually do it like uh, after every epoch. So that's why I said like uh, why epoch is like important. Now their L2 weight decay was, they used L2 weight decay and the decay was uh, five e minus four. So that's fine. So, Next, I think I have a couple of more slides. We are almost out of time. Let me quickly go through these. So we talked about CNNs, right? So that was a general architecture of our standard CNN, but there are many variants. And these are like some initial variants which were proposed and which were found to be effective. So residual network was one of them. What it does is it has a switch like uh, from the input data to at a later stage uh, in your network, it just adds the value and they, whatever you compute here, they call it a residual because you can represent, I think this kind of architecture uh, using this function, using this formulation. So this FX is your residual. This is your uh, input value. 
and you're trying to approximate this residual using this uh, function. So one good use uh, of this was when you were back propagating your uh, gradients. So this is addition and you know that addition, the gradient is distributed, right? So this gradient will flow in this direction as well as in this direction. So as you have deeper networks, your gradients become small and small. So that's called like vanishing gradient and it's an issue because if your gradient is zero, then nothing will be updated like in your initial layers. So this avoided that situation. So we also call these like skip connections. The other was, uh, so yeah, so this was uh, there like to build like deeper networks because this, because the skip connection is allowing you to do gradient back propagation, even if you have a lot of, lot of layers. The second variation is like this inception. And again, we have a lot of other variations of this. This is just the initial version. The idea here is you, the idea here is you want uh, your network to be thicker instead of deeper. And by thicker, what you're trying to do is you're trying to use different set of kernels at the same, uh, at the same location in your image. And this is because like uh, your three cross three filter might not capture what a five cross five kernel might capture, right? So using all these variations at the same time. So that's why your network is like thicker, it's wider. Okay, so the other is Tencent, it's more recent, uh, 2016. And it's similar to ResNet, they have skip connections, but what they are doing is they are saying that whatever features you have extracted like in your initial layers, they might be useful for later layers as well. So therefore, whatever features they extracted, the, instead of passing it just to the next layer, they pass it to like all the future, future layers. So you can see like these uh, view connections here. So this is like one dense block. So whatever features you extracted at this layer, they will be given to this green one, purple one, and so on and so forth. And then you have this sequence of these dense blocks. So this dense block is like this architecture here. And then you can define your dense net architecture. Okay. So yeah, that's it for today. And if you have like any quick questions, we can we can cover those.